Hi everyone. Um, I am Kat Redness. I am here with just a dynamo group of humans um, for our pride panel. And this is just a quick overview. Um, this is a panel exploring the intersections of queerness, creativity, and disability in the arts and in community. Um, and we're going to introduce everybody, but we want to do a couple of, um, you know, uh, acknowledgements and housekeeping things first. So I'm going to invite Heidi to share with us first. Great. Thank you. And as we begin, we pause to acknowledge the place we exist, connect, and create is the traditional unsurrendered territory of the Abenaki people, one of five Wabanaki nations who have a continued and enduring presence with this land. Presence with mountains, with vistas, with forests, waters, and winds presence with people, relations, culture, and creations, presence with light. In Abenaki, Waban refers to the white flickering light in the sky, and a key is the word for land or the earth. So the Wabanaki are the people of the dawn lands. And we acknowledge Wabanaki ancestors, past, present, and future. Thank you for that, and Heidi. Ooh, yeah, yeah go ahead. I was gonna say, and with that, I always pause after that. Um, with it's that, a good I'll moment to pause. <laughs> um, and we have some um, information in the chat box about the um, Abenaki artists and education. Um, so with that, I'll introduce myself. My name is Heidi Swevens and I use she, they pronouns. I am the Director of Community Partnerships at Inclusive Arts Vermont. Um, and for access purposes, I'll do a visual description of myself and surroundings. I have blue eyes and pale skin with short brown hair. And today I'm wearing a turquoise button up shirt with um, earrings that have turquoise people and uh, water droplets. Behind me is an abstract painting, uh, rectangular painting against a white wall. Um, I also, for the purpose and relevance in this conversation, I am a queer disabled artist <laughs> and I am thrilled to be here with this group of people. And I'm gonna pass it on to Kat so we can um, continue on with the conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, and if you are uh, with us along on Facebook, we are putting some of the contents um, in the comment section. So the information about Abenaki artists is there. And if you're watching along with us, that's a great place to put comments, questions, thoughts for our artists. This is also being recorded. And so if you can't make it with us here today, there'll be opportunities to engage with this material later. And we're all accessible later. You can connect with me and Heidi or Richard. We'll, uh, we'll share some of that information. Um, but yeah, so I am Kat Redness. I use she, her pronouns. I am the director of communications and development for Inclusive Arts Vermont. Uh, a visual description for me is I am a fat, femme, platinum, blonde person. Um, I have chubby cheeks and pink lips on today and straight, uh, straight platinum bangs across my forehead. I'm wearing a cozy uh, oatmeal cardigan and I'm sitting in my sunroom, which has black paned windows, um, letting in light and there's foliage seen through the windows. There's some furniture behind me and there might be a cat that wanders into the screen at some point. Um, I also am a queer artist and I'm so happy to be here as part of this queer community. Um, and I am mostly a performing, performing artist um, and so thrilled to be here and kind of, and hear about uh, the artists that we have on this panel as well. Um, just for accessibility, if you're watching along with us and also an invitation to our artists, take care of yourself while you're doing this. If you need to step away or turn your, uh, turn your, camera off for a moment, that's totally fine. We're here, we're just in conversation today. And um, so feel free to ask questions of one another. Um, and if you're following along, feel free to ask questions of us or engage with us through the comment section as well. Um, also a note, and I'll say this, and our artists may say this if they're chatting about something specific, we're talking about queerness, we're talking about identity, we're talking about disability, we're talking about creativity, um, some complex, uh, ideas may come up in there. So just, you know, an awareness that we're all talking about things that are very personal and very big and um, that really kind of, uh, you know, a lot of heart things, a lot of head things, a lot of community things. And so just a mindfulness about that and uh, take care of yourself in whatever way you need to as we're having these conversations. 
Great. Um, I'm going to invite, we're here, part of what we're so excited about, this is Pride Month. Um, we also run a recognize, we just uh, just celebrated uh, Juneteenth and for our the Black members of our community, on, honor that as well. Um, but we're here during Pride Month and we are so excited to collaborate with the Pride Center of Vermont. And we're here with Richard, one of our co-facilitators. Richard, would you introduce yourself for folks? Sure. <clears throat> Hi and hello everyone. My name is Richard Elliott. Uh, as Kat said, I work for the Pride Center of Vermont. I work with our health and wellness program as a coordinator, as well as our QD BIPOC program, our trans, a queer trans person of color program, which builds community and joy amongst the black and queer Vermonters. Um, I am a, I'm a relative, I'm a relatively young individual, uh, light, light-skinned African-American wearing a light nude colored shirt, um, blue bandana, clear glasses, rainbow earring in the left ear. Uh, my background is a pale blue, baby blue, baby blue powder blue wall against a, against a light wood door. Awesome. Awesome, thank you so much, Richard. And um, so, uh, Richard works for the Pride Center. We work for Inclusive Arts Vermont. These are two nonprofits that are really engaging folks through the community in ways to create community, in ways to uh, support folks and do professional development around working with LGBTQIA plus folks. We work specifically at Inclusive Arts Vermont, um, making sure arts environments in the art ecosystem are accessible and inclusive for folks from birth to elders, um, for folks with disabilities, and also work with organizations uh, to do professional development to help them make their programming and make their environments more accessible. Um, we do this through, uh, we're working in schools, we're working with early childhood uh, centers, we work with adult arts, we do professional development with other nonprofits and arts organizations. Um, we also do and that's where we got to meet some of our artists today. We do an, ex an exhibitions program and we do a biennial exhibition featuring Vermont artists with disabilities. And I'm going to let Heidi tell us a little bit more about that. And then we're going to get like actually into the meat of talking to our artists. Thank you for bearing with us. Yeah, I do want to just check. Richard, do you want to say anything more about the Pride Center? Sure. Um, at Point? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So we're proud center. We do have an education and training program as well. This program is built to go out to the community, go out into organizations, whether it be healthcare organizations, clinics, schools, uh, companies, local uh, startups, and teach about queerness, teach about LGBTQ individuals, the LGBT the LGBTQ community, uh, with things such as teaching individuals about pronouns, how to ask questions about queerness, how to ask questions about the LGBTQ community. We give uh, LGBT, LGBTQIA basics, so, uh, essentially kind of a, a, one, a 101 of a, how to, a 101 of the LGBTQ community. Um, some, other, some of the other things we addressed is how to properly use pronouns, how to support LGBTQ people, how to be a proper ally, how to, uh, how to uh, take up space as LGBTQ people and how to step back as an ally. Um, yes, our, our education program is under works right now, but we are doing things to ensure that it is uh, updated and better. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be collaborating on this panel. And um, the last thing I'll say before we turn it over to the artists is a bit of a, how did we get here? <laughs> you know, um, So uh, currently Inclusive Arts Vermont um, has an exhibition called Masked. It's a visual arts exhibition featuring 22 Vermont artists with disabilities, um, two of whom are with us today. Um, it is the fourth visual arts exhibition um, that the organization has done in the past 10 years. And as Kat mentioned, we have a commitment to, to do um, biennial exhibitions. Traveling the state, um, you can find out more about this on our website. Um, I'm excited, I could talk a lot about it. <laughs> um, but it is designed and intended to um, share the work of artists with disabilities, the amazing part of um, artists with disabilities in Vermont, and also to be a community space where accessibility and accessibility features are part of what happens for inclusion. Um, MAST arose, the theme MAST arose early on in the pandemic um, and it has taken on a, a life of its own. The call to artists was about things that are hidden or veiled or kind of um, 
not, you know, mask, um, not out in the forefront. And uh, disability identity, invisible disabilities, often um, there's shame, there's layers, there's complexity, as can be true in the LGBTQ communities. And so um, a couple of our artists in their artist statements also identified um, their queer identities. And we got to thinking and we pride month. Um, and we thought, wouldn't this be interesting to invite artists to talk um, about identities of disability and queerness around creativity and their process. And that's how this got started. So I'm gonna pause at that. I'm sure there's more um, and different angles, but I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation and I wanna um, hand it over to who's gonna facilitate the introductions of the artists. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, so excited to hear uh, what you have to share. Awesome, so that's going to be me. Um, so we have three panelists here today and I'm going to ask them to give their name, the pronouns, a visual description of, of their self, the surroundings, um, their specific artist genre, as well as any identifying language terminology they may want to use for themselves as a LGBTQI persons and or an individual with disability. And also we would like to know um, anything about you, anything that you want to share with the audience. All right, got, all right, everyone. Awesome, let's start with Liam. <laughs> okay, that was caught off guard. Shouldn't have been, but here we are. Uh, my name is Liam. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I am a, a fair skinned, um, kind of looks yellow in this light, but um, individual with uh, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes. I said this before, an unfortunate amount of facial hair. Um, I have pink clear glasses on um, and a sweatshirt that is baby blue and baby pink and white um, because um, I am a trans non-binary artist and I thought it'd be a cute representation. Um, uh, behind me is a disaster, so I have turned blur on, uh, so you can't really see anything behind me. Um, my artistic genres. Uh, I would say a mixed media methods. I, I, I paint, um, I take photographs, I make graphic art, so um, yeah, I and I also like to combine them all, which is what I ended up doing for the masked exhibition. Um, so there's that. Uh, I am a queer, non-binary, disabled artist. Um, anything I want people to know. Um, I think we're gonna get into that. I don't need to take up too much time in the intro to talk about that. So thank you. Awesome, thank you very much, Liam. Let's bounce to Shay. Hey all, so happy to be here. My name is Shay Witzo. Uh, I use they, them pronouns predominantly. Uh, I am a fat white person. I have wire rim glasses on. I have very long uh, graying dark brown straight Willie Nelson braids on today and usually. I'm wearing a tan shacket which is a combination of a shirt and a jacket. Uh, and behind me, uh, there's a bookshelf that's full of plants and cluttery knickknacks. There is a pie safe. And there's a piece of art on the wall that's from Bread and Puppet that says strategy. And it has a yellow circle with a chair and a heart and an outstretched hand on it. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, I am also a queer artist. I uh, live with chronic illness. I am a sicko who's coming into disabled identity. Uh, and um, I make things in so many ways. <laughs> I'm a musician. I do um, performance art and sort of outdoor landscape based spectacle work. Um, I'm a zinester, I do drawings, I do printmaking, um, I play music, I make puppets, um, 
I'm one of those folks that stuff just shoots out of my hands in any type of way that it wants to, and I can't really control it. Uh, gift from source, I guess. <laughs> um, le makes for a very chaotic studio space, but I'm here and I'm grateful. I just want to say zinster is like one of my new favorite words. I love that. Zinster. <laughs> Made some fat, fatty zines back in the day. It's amazing. Love that. <laughs> Thank you, Shay. Up next, we have Aurora. Hey, y'all. I'm Aurora. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, so visual description, I am sitting uh, outside a coffee shop. So if you overhear background noise while I'm talking, I apologize. I cannot control the rest of the world. Um, and also some trucks and motorcycles like really loudly go by. Perfect time in car. Um, so behind me is a brick wall on one side and a window that is reflecting like an umbrella um, behind me on the other side. There are some great pillows behind me, which I'm very pleased by. Um, I am a pale white woman. I have dark blonde hair and a bun. I have uh, rectangular black metal glasses. I am wearing a black sweatshirt with white zipper and little white strings. Um, I have a black and white flowered tank top underneath that. I also have some black um, Bluetooth headphones on that are very annoying. Um, and I have a little silver necklace with a piece of ponderosa bark. Um, I also have a lot of silver rings and a watch and I talk with my hands a lot. So I assume you'll see them at some point. Um, what do I do? Good Lord. Um, I'm a photographer by trade. Um, Photography is the work that I've had in, in inclusive art Vermont shows. So primarily a photographer, I guess. Um, but I'm also an art teacher. I teach art in uh, Stratford, Vermont, and also now at uh, the Mountain School in Berkshire, Vermont. So I have been branching out in my artistic methods because you can't teach cyanotype with uh, kindergartners, um, at least not without getting parents to sign release and uh, I didn't want to do that so I also am a writer um, I write a lot about disability and uh, contemporary arts historical arts um, some of that work is on my website if you would like to find it and that's all thank you very much for that Shay thank you everybody thank you very much for Aurora and thank you everybody for introducing themselves greatly appreciate it Great. And this is Heidi. I think it's time to get into the, the depth of the conversation. And when we were planning this, we thought we're going to keep these questions to a minimum, these prompts to a minimum, because I don't think it's going to take long to get the, the conversation going. But the first one, and this is for the panelists, and, um, and we'll kind of reflect later, but how do queerness and or disability identities influence your creative process? And I'm gonna just see if there's anybody who wants to go first and if you can raise a hand, um, Kat will announce. I, with my low vision, I won't necessarily see that, but we'll see if there's anybody who wants to go first on that one. Go ahead, How do Aurora, yeah, yeah. I can do that one. Um, <laughs> so queerness and disability identities um, are kind of what my art is about. So um, for the last, how many years have I been living here? For the last like, six or seven years, um, my art has been primarily about disability and the experience of being a disabled uh, woman, disabled queer person um, in my life. Um, I was gonna say in society, but it's very specifically about me um, because maybe I'm a narcissist, but most of my work is self-portraiture um, and it's very much about being in my body, being in the experience of uh, the situations that I've been living in for the last five or six years, which have all been very heavily influenced by my disability. Um, not so heavily influenced by my queerness because I have come from a very liberal family, lived in very liberal places, um, went to very liberal colleges. And so I very luckily did not have to deal with a lot of the discrimination that I would have faced living elsewhere. Um, which is incredibly 
lucky and I'm incredibly thankful for it. Um, however, it is something that has come up a lot in um, my own explanation of my work because what tends to happen is I take a photograph of myself and I see what I see in it. And then other people come to it and they bring their preconceived notions of what they expect to see in a photograph of a woman, um, a disabled person. And uh, specifically the piece of art that I have in this show, which I think we'll show later, um, has a bunch of tool in it. And that work got heavily critiqued by my professors when I was in grad school as being about a wedding dress. And I um, continually brought up that tool does not have to mean wedding dress. Uh, but it was something that it came back over and over and over. Um, is this a piece about a wedding dress? Is this a piece about getting married? Are you like trying to show your wedding dress and like build some kind of, it wasn't, it was about connective tissue. So they were way off. Um, but it was something that kept coming back. And that was, I think, actually the first time that queerness was really part of the critique of my work because I had to keep bringing it back to, no, this is a self-portrait is about my life not about whatever projected life you put on it but um, it's about me and my disability and my connective tissue disorder which is why I made a bunch of connective tissue out of school um, so heavily influenced really interesting um, to see how other people put their perceived ideas of what a queer disabled person should be onto self-portraits Hopefully that gave Shay and Liam enough time to get their thoughts together. <laughs> Thanks, Aurora. And we're going to spin back around. So, you know, if you have a thought after, we're, we're trying to design this so it's a back and forth and a conversation and to be generative um, and no right or wrongs. But I'm curious who's next. Who'd like to go next? I can go next if you don't mind, Liam. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I think my uh, previous statement about being sort of mediumless is really related to me, to my relationship to gender and sexuality and um, disability and body, which is that I am not a person who feels a particular um like liberation and specificity of um identity i feel like i'm always finding language that's close enough i'm always finding like um you know close enough language to help me meet other people who have similar enough experiences um it, it, it functions as a way of connecting with community mostly for me in that I feel like language falls short for my personal <laughs> experience of my body in this world, um, my relationship to this world. And um, I also feel that way about art practice, which is I am finding the medium, the way of communicating that's going to get me close enough to these sort of like lightning visions that come to me or these like magic uh, next horizon uh, utopic worlds I want us to live into, et cetera. And so, um, you know, if puppets are the medium that's gonna get us there, we're gonna do puppets. <laughs> if it's music, it's gonna be music. And if it's a print, it's gonna be a print, but like, it's not, I'm not, I don't feel very committed to any um, specificity and there's pros and cons to that worldview. Um, it's a bit confusing, it's kind of, amorphous and more of an existential crisis than it needs to be maybe a lot of the time but um you know I think when I was coming into my identity as a queer person I really felt like I wasn't sure where I fit because I didn't have very clear language about it because it was really messy my specific way of being queer was I didn't meet anybody who had had my specific experience before um it was sort of like maybe called pansexuality or bisexuality now but like growing up in rural Iowa, I really did not have any models for that. My like experience of gender is like, well, nothing's really right. So I guess I'm other, you know what I mean? Like I'm outside of this construct, obviously, but like, I don't have really like affirming language for what it is. And around my body, I feel like coming into disability identity is like been a slow process of like, oh, these things 
these things inform, socially inform the way that I move in the world. These ways of my body being um, inform the way I move in this ableist world. And so I think this is the closest language that will help connect me to other people who experience the world in this way or help people understand my experience of the world in this way. But um, yeah, I think that I'm, I'm essentially I'm a hot mess on every front and it's very consistent. And that is how it's connected to me. <laughs> well, thank you, Shay. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, and I, I'm imagining that people have notes and they're going to want to respond. But Liam, I want to turn it over to you first and um, see where, what your response is to the prompt about how um, the queerness and disability identities influence your creative process. So in listening to Shay, I, a lot of things resonated around like, not necessarily having words uh, ab about um, identity or like concrete ways to express identity. Um, and I think that, I mean, the earliest art that I have is like all rainbows. So like I've been drawing rainbows since I could, you know, hold utensils. Um, and I think, also, um, in terms of what Aurora was saying about self-portraiture, a lot of my work has been self-portraits. In in high school, I did my like the, my senior like thesis. This was a high school. I was like, no, nah, I didn't go to art school. Um, but it was a series of self-portraits that uh, really explored gender across the spectrum. I have um, paintings of me very feminine in a dress. Um, and then I, I, have, I have paintings over there that are me looking very much like Justin Bieber. Um, and looking back on, you know, that collection of work has been really interesting. Um, you know, like hindsight, I'm like, oh, I was like, dealing with this gender thing a long time ago. Um, and, and now it things started making sense. Um, things started making a lot of sense uh, when the pandemic uh, first hit and we were all inside and I was living in Western Massachusetts um, and I had recently uh, left my job due to migraines um getting I was having migraines every single day and so even like before the pandemic I was spending a lot of time at home by myself um and I came across um a loc um the oh. poet a loc the artist a loc um and I almost immediately went online and like bought feminine clothes because I was like, if I'm only gonna be at home by myself, then I can wear whatever I want, which has like, here we are a few years later, translated to me being able to feel confident dressing however I want it out in public. Um, but let me circle it back. So um, self-portraiture, bought the clothes, did a photo shoot with myself, wearing the clothes that I like keep in my closet so I can like see that it's okay for me to wear all these beautiful clothes. Um, and that's how gender identity comes in. And then I think in terms of, I also just, I've always been a creative person, um, writing, um, music, performing arts um, in a way that's really allowed me to express myself outside the social norms. Um, you know, even doing plays in, oh, sorry, um, doing plays in elementary school is where I could, you know, be extra without being criticized for being extra. Um, and I forgot my last thought. Oh, the last thought I was gonna make was, I also related a lot to what Shay was saying about um, kind of not having a specific medium and just being like, where is this 
project gonna uh, take me? And I think that uh, my neurodivergence um, is both like a blessing and a curse when it comes to that because uh, I can see beauty and a project in literally everything. And therefore I have so many projects going at the same time. Um, but yeah, so living with a disability, the, the neurodivergence is one thing, but then the like chronic migraine. Sometimes I'm at home by myself, kind of in the dark for days at a time. And sometimes I can like collage and do stuff like that. So I am gonna end there because I, that those were all the thoughts I had. <laughs> Thanks, Liam. Yeah. Don't know if there's any responses to that initial prompt before we move on to the second one. Are there artists who are like, wait, wait, I gotta say something. I wanna add. Um, quickly to add to um, Shay, especially, well, first of all, I had a professor in college who literally referred to me as a hot mess and would introduce me that way to people. So she's like, do you know this person? This is Aurora, she's a hot mess. So I got you. Um, but what I was going to say before you said that was um, that I really relate to uh, the artistic existential crisis and the just not having language or even art materials that can quite express what it is that you're trying to get to. Um, because I know that that's definitely true for me for a long time. I have felt like there isn't language to explain my queerness um, to people. And so I just don't. Uh, queer is just sort of my blanket term for it. Um, and people will be like, what does that mean? And I'm like, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but also like material, the materiality of trying to find the thing that expresses the ideas the best. Um, I go through a lot with material. Um, I do a lot with like different weird materiality with photographs. Um, and lately, for some reason, I've become a watercolor artist. I don't know about that. Um, that's, I think, more out of the pure accessibility than um, true desire to be a watercolor artist. But uh, it's something that I can do while laying in bed. And uh, taking self portraits in the woods is not a thing I can do while laying in bed, and is a lot more physically uh, require, more physically demanding. Um, but I was thinking about that and how much I relate to that. Um, the other thing I thought of that I did not say, which was important was the reason that I'm a photographer, um, which is that I have a visual disability and cameras sort of compensate for it for me. Um, and so I've always been really drawn to cameras because they let me see things that I can't see otherwise. That is the reason I'm a photographer, not some other obscure reason so thank you yeah i i do have a <clears throat> quick question for all the panels because i know it's a bit of a through line if you don't mind me asking yeah. sure um is, is it right in saying that each of you had a bit of a tumultuous time figuring out your queerness is, is that more or less more or less um during those times when you were figuring out your queer queerness and you knew you were an artist, um, do you do you sense a change between your art then and now? And is there some some sort of reflection you've done on your art uh, when it came to those things? Can I share something? Wow. I have been a performer forever. I feel like artist is the least. Uh, you know, questioned of the many identities I hold in a way. It's just like always been really forward. But the other day I saw a picture from a parade float that I was the star of as a child where I was wearing a muscle suit and was it was a beef days parade because I'm from Iowa and we celebrate beef where I come from. And they were playing Macho Man by the village people. And I'm like doing muscle poses in the center of this uh, parade float in this muscle insulated muscle suit and I sometimes don't understand how myself and all the other people around me were not 
understanding my gender and queerness stuff at the time. I'm like thinking back to my first theatrical roles. I was always cross gender cast. I played a wizard. I played problematic Aladdin as a six year old, very <laughs> awful. I played all these roles as a child where I was always either an old crone or a man. <laughs> uh, and I look back at this like through line of this like performance career and I'm like, where were you all? What were you? <laughs> Why was no adult in the room? Like we need to have a conversation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and so I feel like I always knew on some level that I felt alienated by the structures around me, around dating and gender and all these things, but I didn't have like a forward model of like what to name it. So in a way it was not tumultuous at all. And in a way I feel like it's been very consistent <laughs> and maybe the languaging or finding community or being able to live it out loud uh, in a different way have been, <laughs> been developments. But I look at art that I made back when I thought I was a straight woman and it is very, very queer, <laughs> gender queer. It's like, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Liam, go ahead, yeah. I have a very similar um, experience of even, you know, performing. I was cast as um, Oliver in the musical Oliver and it was the highlight of my young performer career because I got to play this little boy um, and it brought me such joy to be able to just like be unapologetically like just like be a different gender in a way that people weren't like critiquing. Nobody was like, oh, like, why is that little girl playing a little boy? Um, it was like, wow, you're really good at what you're doing. Um, at, and the, yeah, looking back on how like, so how I became like more and more socially constructed in terms of things, uh, in terms of gender, in terms of uh, queerness and even in terms of like disability um, and, and and masking, it it felt like there's been so much like I can look back and be like wow I was living my best life and then like so society and then like now I feel like I'm in this process of like taking off different masks and um, that's been incredibly liberating to like look back and be like oh wait this existed the whole time this has always existed um and yeah i i learned the que i learned the term um like neuroqueer um during the pandemic and i think that that is something that resonates most with me as somebody who like doesn't necessarily i've never really understood like social constructs or as a child I didn't right and then I and then I became aware of them and then they kind of dictated who I was in the world and and learning the term neuroqueer kind of gave me permission to be like actually I like existing outside of the lines is what I've always done and it's okay for me to continue to do that and holy cow it feels a lot better. Um, I'm living a much better version of, I'm living life as a much better version of myself, I guess. Thank you both for that. Aurora, do you wanna add anything to that or? Sure. Um, interestingly, now that you bring it up, I think I started taking self-portrait, the, the naked self-portraits. Um, right around the time that I like fully decided like that queer was the correct term for what I was what I was dealing with um so I sort of came into that piece of my identity right around the same time that I started doing um a lot of my disability identity stuff and I think it was mostly that I took a long hard look at myself and was like whatever the heck you're doing it's not working <laughs> um, need to figure out what what it is that you're actually doing. Um, and it was also at the same time, like the first time that I had lived alone, um, it was the first time that I had had any sort of like control over the things that were going on around me. Um, but they all sort of culminated at the same time as this like 
self-portrait photo journey thing that has been going on ever since. Richard, is it okay if I just, can I just offer a quick reflection on this? First of all, thank you all just for the beautiful sharing that you're doing. It's just wonderful. And I just think like, and I don't want to make a false comparison, but I also think that like anti-fatness is so rooted in ableism. And I think about like what you're talking about right now is so important because you're talking about like that arts, the arts give us an opportunity to try things on that maybe in a moment in our lives weren't safe for us to try on in actuality, but that performing it can be, and I apologize for the dogs barking in the background, but you know, like I think too about you all putting art into the world that represents that trying on or that early exploration. And I think about like, for me as like a queer fat person, like when I finally saw bodies like mine represented in art, the way that that changed how I could embrace myself and like look at my own fatness, my own queerness and own it in a different way was so crucial. And I think like so many fat liberationists that I follow, like that's what they say is representation, seeing or experiencing other folks who shared identities. That was the single most impactful thing about self-acceptance and self-liberation that I ever experienced. So I love like one, that you're talking about how you explore that and two, how you're talking about what you're putting out in the world. And I think about other people experiencing that also and what that might, the impact that might have for other folks. So thank you for letting me share that and just great. I wanna say a moment about uh, fat liberation also, which is that I feel so grateful to my younger self for doing some big work around fat acceptance and fat liberation that paved the way for me to be able to accept my increasingly disabled body much more readily <laughs> and to like really be so grateful to be like moving into that community when that experience came into my body later on because I had been, you know, making art about the way that fatness informed my like social relationships for such a while already that, you know, it was not a big stretch for me to then say, okay, now like disability is another, you know, different, but analogous experience in some ways where I'm immediately able to like understand that seeing disabled artists in the world is probably going to help me contextualize my experience. Immediately able to say connecting with disabled community is probably going to really help me like move through and process and be in this experience in ways that are liberatory or healing or peacemaking or whatever in my life. And I very regularly am grateful to Baby Shay for, for like taking that leap kind of early because it was less popular at the time. We didn't have Instagram aging right. myself. And, um, and that became a really useful sort of like framework of how to move into a sort of marginalized identity space for me later when I was like, oh my gosh, now I, I've already been, I've already been challenging fat phobia. I've already been the person who's like being a, you know, <laughs> like challenger of this thing in space for a long time, as well as trying to be an ally or an accomplice yeah. to other marginalized people for some time. But like that really, yeah, made a, becoming chronically a, a, a lot more less shocking and more like ex accepted and normalized for me like yeah people have all kinds of bodies obviously duh yeah yeah <laughs> Liam go for it I see you've got something on your mind I love it share well I think that there's there's this intersection of queerness and disability specifically around like chronic illness that comes to mind and and I did my thesis in um, graduate school a little bit on this in terms of like, you know, like queerness and like experiencing challenging things as as a youth. Um, and so like in the in the, the what happens to the nervous system under like chronic stress or like not seeing yourself portrayed um, and like this this state of of being in defense against, you know, constantly having to def def uh, defend yourself or, you know, um, and so it to me makes a lot of sense that a lot of queer folks also have chronic illnesses, 
chronic conditions or are disabled. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to draw that line as well. Yeah. Just uh, anecdotally, I saw a statistic today too. It is a much, it's a higher percentage. It's, you know, it's about the national population, like for folks with disabilities is about 25%. I think it goes up to about 33% if you are just looking at the LGBTQIA population. So it is a higher percentage of folks with disabilities in queer community. Yeah. And I work at a queer anti-violence program inside of Crad Center. Shout out to Safe Space. And a huge percentage of the folks that we're connecting with and supporting and being in community with name disability as a central aspect of their lives in addition to queerness or transness or um, you know other marginalized identities. And I feel like when I'm seeing that, I'm always like, and where is the disability forward language in all of the pride events that are happening out in the world? You know what I'm saying? This is a huge, huge part. Even if it was a small part, it would be worth it. And this is a huge part of our community. And I think we have a long way to go within the LGBTQ plus umbrella to like really center access practice in the way that you all so excellently do it. Inclusive Arts Vermont. I think, you know, Pride Center does a lot of access work too. And in the larger community, we have a lot of work to do to make Pride events and all events uh, more accessible to all folks. Thanks for that, Shay. Yes. Uh, and this is Heidi. I want to say just one thing around the sort of invisible disabilities and higher percentage in people who are queer because of stress and that sort of thing. Um, and, and thank you, Shay, for that. <laughs> but disability, people with disabilities are in all communities, all groups of people, all ages, all genders, ethnicities, races. It, it's just, um, my experience, which is just my experience, but there was so much shame at having a disability because of inherent systems of ableism. And for me, um, I was kissing girls in high school, but a lot of shame around that too, that was hidden. And then I um, had changes in my vision in my early twenties. And I remember like in hindsight, having this thought, I can't be blind and gay. Like that was just too much marginalization for me at the time, my 20 something year old self. And it turns out I am queer, you know, whatever language you wanna have. But as I've unpacked and unlayered and um, met people who are disabled, who are wonderful, who are queer, I, it, it's, the shame has dis dissolved. And I think that that's part of what keeps things hidden in our society. So the more visibility, the more conversations, the more one person can be okay with himself and like take that nude picture. <laughs> um, and share or not that 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 just has like sparkling effects um and hopefully younger people now will have more examples and more models of people to look up for in all di diverse packaging um and beautiful beautifulness but um i'm really glad i've changed since that 20 something year old self because the blindness isn't going away and the queerness isn't and i don't want it to you know so um I'm mindful of our time. I'm so not usually the timekeeper, but I wonder if it's okay if we move on to the second prompt, which will take us yeah. from like, it's, I feel like it's a bridge, right? Like from what we do as artists to like the putting it into the world. So yeah. I'll, I'll take it from here then. Um, so next, so next uh, prompt is gonna be, so can y'all share your experience with us navigating the art scene and the art profession as a disabled queer artist? Go for it, Liam, yeah. So I, I think this connects really, this is a very good transition because I, I as Jay was talking about um, accessibility, I, um, part of experiencing chronic migraines is missing out on a lot of um, community and spending a lot of time by myself, which is very lonely, um, but really, um, yeah, I just lost my train of thought, but, um, it really prevents me sometimes from being able to engage in community and being able to be around people who look like me, who, you know, have similar, um, disabilities and gender identities. And so the isolation, I think, of, having a chronic condition has also kind of like birthed my like art um, from a place of looking for connection um, elsewhere. And yeah, I, 
there was more to that thought, but that's all I got for this second. <laughs> that's fine. If it, if it comes back, if it comes back, you can speak up. Shay Aurora, you want to jump in? Sure. So um, <clears throat> my, my big thing is also definitely related to access. Um, I mean, being queer in the arts community is kind of lovely because you meet other queer people. There's a lot of queer artists out there. Um, you end up, you know, in community with people who have things in common with you. But that being said, um, I, because of my visual disability, I can't drive. And that has been the most isolating thing um, I can possibly imagine at the moment because I, uh, when the, before the pandemic started actually, the pandemic just didn't help. Um, I moved from Los Angeles where I could get an Uber to a train into downtown LA and I could go to galleries and I could see people and I could go to openings every night if I wanted to, usually too tired, but I could have. Um, to living in very rural Vermont, relying on my parents for rides anywhere I want to go um, or need to go, like work or doctor's appointments or you know my daily trip to and from my job. Um, and so that has been really isolating. And I live about two hours from Burlington and Montpelier. So I'm not able to go to openings even now that we have them again. Um, I haven't made it to a single one of the inclusive art Vermont openings that I've been part of. Uh, I will one day, I swear, but <laughs> I haven't made it to one yet. Um, and so that disability has really created an access barrier for me within the arts community. Um, and I've been part of several, you know, online shows. I've been a part of several online residencies, but it's just not the same thing. Um, I so look forward to the day that I get to actually meet the people that I have these conversations with. I have had three different like video Zoom talks with Inclusive Arts Vermont and I have yet to meet a single one of you in person, no. which just like makes me sad. Um, it'll happen this summer, I swear, once I like find a way to get Burlington. Um, but I, that's, that's my big thing is the, the art world is so inaccessible to people who don't have basic physical access to places. Thank you for that, Aurora. Shay, do you want to have, you have anything? Yeah. Um, I think, um, Experiencing um, particularly mobility challenges has um, really, to a certain level, like there, you know, that that can look so many different ways. And for me, it really looks usually quite a lot like pain. Um, and so it it has that aspect of my experience has really informed um, the way that I make work and the way that I can see work. Um, and it has informed my, you know, choices to do other things for work also. <laughs> you know, uh, I can't um, be like a tour bus guy. <laughs> I can't be like on, you know, like staying out late every night at places that don't have adequate seating, et cetera, et cetera, in ways that I maybe could have when I was 20. Um, and yeah, so I feel like there, you know, there's just like a lot of things that I, have to be more considerate of in my surroundings now, which really limits um, the lack of those things being there really limits my ability to do a lot of different kinds of work professionally, um, art wise. And um, I also feel like, you know, some work that I have sustained over time, I think it's notable is um, in a group I work with a performance company called the Royal Frog Ballet, and we do um, a lot of outside landscape-based theater work. Um, and my crew has been so, um, such a tight team that we're able to haul my props out to the backfield, despite me not being able to do that on my own, right? Like there's, uh, from each according to ability to each according to need kind of a vibe in that um, small 
well-developed collective space that means that I am feeling decreasing amounts of guilt over time at allowing someone to carry the like ridiculous thing I've constructed out into an orchard for me <laughs> or whatever. Um, and so I feel like, you know, in all of these aspects of identity, I feel like um, interdependence is really important to me. And I feel like that's the thing that informs my creative practice and my life more uh, because of the gifts that disability has given me. Um, and I think, you know, that means that I can't do as much like solo stuff on my own uh, without um, buddies as accommodations. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I've moved into different materials and things that um, have allowed me to keep working. I, I do more digital stuff now. My like backwoods Luddite self has compromised a lot into the world of, uh, you know, drawing pads or my backwoods woodcut self has compromised into uh, rubber uh, printmaking materials, things that are just easier on my body um, have enabled me to keep going and keep making, often not professionally. Uh, and I would say during the pandemic uh, time, the, you know, the, it feels like much of the world has moved on from accommodations for folks who are more vulnerable. And I am struggling to figure out where my role is in a professional landscape of no masking and no distancing and no, uh, <laughs> you know, packed venues full of maskless people are not accessible to me right now in my health. And like, that's really, really been extremely alienating and tough and sad and like, makes the landscape based outside theater stuff look more and more appealing all the time. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, there's access limits everywhere. There's roots and, uh, you know, rocks outside that make it tougher for folks to be there as well. So it's always about finding the most access we can, I feel like in a space. And, 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 and I say no to a lot more things now than I used to. Um, no is a whole sentence and I'm learning that that's also a gift. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Thank Go you, ahead, everyone. Liam. Yeah. Uh, I also I, I wanted to like circle back. Um, thank you so much, Shay. Um, I, I I just also wanted to um, Aurora mentioned you know moving to a more rural spot. Um, I used to live in Western Massachusetts in Northampton, which was like queer Mecca. Um, and I, yeah, I had to leave my job um, due to these migraines, which put me on disability um, and also kind of forced me to move back to where I grew up. Uh, sounds like similar kind of to what Aurora was talking about. Um, and something that I don't know if a lot of people know this, but, um, I wouldn't be able to necessarily like live in Vermont with, with what I need in terms of like a, a single person apartment, um, on disability. Uh, it's just, to be frank, it's like, <laughs> like $1,200, right? And and you, it hard pressed to find an apartment um, that's under $900 um, throughout Vermont, not even just in Burlington. And so, yeah, moving to my hometown has put me in a much more rural space where queerness is, uh, <sighs> When I was in high school, I was the only queer person at my high school. Uh, only like out queer person at my high school, right? Like yeah. there were obviously other queer people, but they weren't out. And um, my understanding is now that the high school, now the high schoolers have like a, a bigger queer following or whatever, queer community. But for somebody in their mid twenties, there's no queer community here for me. Um, and so I think that that has pushed me more towards art uh, because I, I, what am I gonna do? I live literally in the mountains. Uh, and so I tried to make 
a living as an artist, but that can, that brought its own challenges because it's really hard to do a commission piece and explain to the person, hey, it might take me a lot longer than it would take another person because I'm dealing with all these different like conditions or experiences. And, you know, the queer community has been really great about, yeah, like do what you need to do, um, but it, that's uh, not a great avenue to make like substantial income for me. And so, yeah, I think that that, um, the financial piece of, yeah, being a queer disabled artist is very real. <laughs> Yeah, you brought up a couple of points that, you know, I know Heidi and I talk about a lot, this idea of um, independence versus interdependence and independence is amazing, you know, and I think like independence is amazing, but we often stigmatize inter interdependence and like interdependence is going to be the forever reality for a lot of folks. And when we hold independence up on this pedestal of like the end all be all goal of everything, there are people who that's never going to be possible for and there's people who don't want that many people who don't want that and also our society you know maybe would function a lot better if we if we focus more on interdependence and then also this idea of professionalism and what how we define professionalism in all in all forms of community and I think Liam what you're talking about right there right is like you know traditional very like white supremacy culture professionalism is you do things on this deadline, you know, this is what it is and this is this and everything's efficiency and everything's a timeline and everything's this. Um, and, you know, X amount of hours equals this, this, this. But that's not a reality that a lot of people can exist within. And so I think that there's something amazingly radical and really important about breaking down those ideas of professionalism, but we're also still functioning in the society that adheres to them. There are many people adhere to them. And so it can be a real challenge to try to say like, I don't, I don't adhere to that. I can't, like, it's not my reality to do that. And so um, it's, it's a very powerful and challenging thing. And, you know, it's another way that almost like you know, we talk about masking and we talk about coming out or letting people in that, you know, there to have those conversations can be vulnerable to say, this is what I need as an artist and a professional. Um, and it may be different than what you expect. This is Heidi and it might change. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think the pandemic, another, uh, and this is not a Pollyanna silver lining kind of thing. It's just sort of sitting with myself and my my brain and heart and spirit, but every plan. I, for a long time, I've been saying, I wanna plan for spontaneity because um, like you, Aurora, I'm a non-driver and um, I planning gets me places, but spontaneity makes me come alive. <laughs> so I want both. I mean, I want it all, right? Um, but I think the pandemic for so many reasons um, and so many shifting moving pieces, there's a lot of present moment, like, oh, that's what was gonna happen it's gonna shift. It's almost like life's improv, you know, and there's some ways that creative um, creative approaches and, um, you know, the disability community with adaptability and innovation and interdependent, there's some skill sets and some knowledges from artists and um, disabled people in queer communities that I think are uh, relevant and could be of benefit to others. Um, as frustrating as they can be, I don't mean to sit here and think, oh yeah, I just adapt, I just adapt. I have um, a fantasy of, a, an adult um, temper tantrum choreography, if anyone wants to take that on, because there's just so much going on that's that's real. Um, but I think there's also like ways to have individual shifting moving pieces and understanding that it's not personal as much as it affects us personally and coming together in community with that, um, without the shame, without the blame, you know, like sometimes it's just something changed and it's not a person's fault. Um, and now what, how do we, create a community of care here um, for what needs to be done and what's the priority now. I don't know if I was just babbling. I think I was, I hope that makes sense. Um, because what I'm, these are, you know, we're talking it about sense. creative it performance <laughs> and yeah. it's also survival. It's also yeah. like, you know, how am I gonna pay my rent? How am I gonna get my insulin? How am I gonna get to the, you know, whatever. Um, so it's, it's, it's a both and all. So this 
like sort of whole conversation makes me think of um, a book that's kind of infamous in the disability community and possibly also the queer community, which is Care Work by Leah, I can never say her last name, um, Piepsna Samarinsa, I want to say. Sorry, Leah, if I just butchered your name. Um, but it's a book that I actually have some issues with personally. And the reason is that I don't think that her concept of communal care translates to rural areas. Oh. Um, and she she writes this book, she, she, just about every uh, like disabled, uh, you know, academic person is, is like obsessed with this book. Um, Yes, um, <laughs> but it's something that has always bothered me about it. And it's the way that she frames um, disability as, is as a community of caring uh, disabled people who are able to come together and lift each other up and help each other. And that's something that I just don't think works in a place outside of cities. Um, and she's writing from a very disability centric place. It's, I mean, she lives in um, Oakland which is sort of the center of disability rights and, and all these people. Um, it's where a lot of people end up who are uh, disability activists. And I know that it's possible in places like New York City or LA, but when I think about who I can call where I live, if I need something, it's a very, very short list that includes two people I'm related to and no one else. And those two people are contractually obligated to drive me places. Bye our, you know, familial obligation. So I just, I think about that a lot because I see it come up a lot of this idea of independence versus interdependence. And there just are places where interdependence isn't working. And how do we reconcile with the idea that maybe interdependence would be good, but it's not something that's available for people. Um, and I took a job um, recently and one of the big things about taking that job was, can I get to this job? And I called Vermont Voc Rehab and they said, well, we can offer to pay someone for the first 60 days of your job to drive you. But after the first 60 days, we kind of assume you'll have it figured out. They said, there's zero public transit between Stratford and Berkshire. Are you kidding me? It's literally a dirt road. And they were like, well, if you get a, you know, if you get, assessed to get your rides you can get 12 free rides a year from a volunteer driver if there's a volunteer driver in your area and they said 12 free rides a year is not going to get me to a job that doesn't work um and so i had to then have a very uncomfortable conversation with my parents where it was like hey are you okay with one of you having to spend your whole week driving me to and from work is that a thing that we can do is that a thing that works in your schedule? Is that a thing that's going to be really upsetting to you that you spend all your time driving your 20 something year old daughter around so that she can have a basic job? Um, and you know, then they said, well, if we're ever out of town or busy, we'll just call someone else and they can give you a ride. And I was like, I don't have that person. And also everyone I would call is like my coworker and will be at work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thanks for the thought. <laughs> and so it's something that I think about a lot with that rural, that rural piece. And I can see Liam has a thought, so I will stop talking because I can go on forever. <laughs> go ahead, Liam. No, thanks, Aurora. Aurora. Yeah, go ahead, Liam. I was debating whether to put it in the chat, but then I was like losing what you were saying, so I wanted to pay attention. So I was hoping the cat would see my hand, but that it was like not super obvious. Um, <laughs> I just, the only people really in my town is my mom and my stepdad. Um, and the other day I had to call my mom for something and she's come a very long way in terms of accepting my queerness. However, she still cannot use the right pronouns, does not understand, does not understand gender at all. Really, um, I've been out as a trans person. I, I, trans, I transitioned, um, you know, in 2015, and she has just now started using consistently he/him pronouns. Um, so that's like 
progress, I guess. Um, but just the, you know, another layer of, of being a, a disabled person. And, and, you know, those are the circumstances that brought me back to my hometown. And then having to, yeah, rely on family who doesn't acknowledge my gender identity is, you know, just fueled my creativity, I suppose, or my art. But um, yeah, relying on family is uh, complicated. Mm. Um, I just want to, we are about 14 minutes from kind of when we've decided we would end this, which is also arbitrary, um, but I also want to respect your time. And I want, because you're artists and you, we have some work, I want to have an opportunity to show some of your art briefly um, and then give a few minutes to kind of wrap up and think of any questions. Does that feel okay? Is that a good moment to do that? Just so we can make sure that's happening. Great. Shay, I have your art pulled up first. So Shay, we're gonna start with Shay Witzow's art. Shay, um, let me know if you would like me to do verbal descriptions or if you want to do them. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get your art up. So this is Shay Witzow's Art, a Collection. So great. So Shay, you want to tell us a little bit about this first piece? Yeah, this is a, this is just a, I just shared a random smattering of images with you and I can describe each of them. I don't think it's in any way like collectively representative of everything, but it's a few things that I can share. This is a photograph um, of uh, me, a white person uh, wearing with a ukulele in hand, and I'm wearing a paper mache possum hat. It's so awesome. <laughs> and a furry costume, and there are baby possum puppets mysteriously hovering above my shoulders, and I'm singing. Uh, and it's kind of lit from underneath and the background is very dark. Um, and so that it visually describes a piece that I did with the Royal Frog Ballet, my, my, my performance crew, um, which was, is a, we have done pre-pandemic uh, annual fall sunset farm show <laughs> of surrealist work called the Surrealist Cabaret. And this piece um, was um, Mama Possum singing to the babies about um, death and existentialism. <laughs> and uh, I, I really, in actuality, am the babies, but for logistical purposes and playing the mom <laughs> possum in this uh, piece. And other folks are puppeteering the baby Joey's above me, and we all sang together. Oh it's my gosh. Sweet. All right. Uh, video available on the internet. I can like link in the comments later. Very of cool. Our performance of it, but. All right. That's, uh, this is a photograph of a, a blue sky, sunny day, a farm landscape in the background and two masked figures in grandma outfits and grandma paper mache masks uh, doing voguing poses in the front, striking a pose. And uh, one of those masked figures is me. And these are some grannies from that same show. And I have loved um, inhabiting a crone character archetype in that um, I do not have to hide my back pain and my shuffling walk. I can um, complain loudly about my <laughs> pain <laughs> and telling people to slow down and uh, live it into this archetypical character. Um, while the, these, these characters live in that show context as the sort of guides, shepherds um, that help folks get to where they need to go. And that's one of the roles that I regularly play in that space. Lovely. Great. This is a photograph of a piece that I um, made. It's a uh, gray overcast sky and um, you know grassy uh, landscape that's uh, autumnal. The grass is uh, withered and tan, oatmeal colored and um, overgrown. And there's a figure standing in the middle of the photograph 
uh, a woman with long dark hair in a sort of sequins dark outfit and a black hat. And she's standing over um, something that I will describe as a blanket puppet. <laughs> she's standing over like a big weird object that's like a floppy thing, mostly fabric covered in little bits of fabric, tool, glittery texture, bobbles and pom-poms and stuff. Um, and that is a piece that I used other uh, uh, folks as performers to uh, perform and my body could not do the thing that was the vision. Um, but this puppet uh, started out on one side with somebody hiding underneath it and a figure walked over to the puppet and laid down on top of it and then the whole puppet flipped over and the the person underneath matched the world so this is the second person her outfit is cosmic the puppet is cosmic and on the other side of the puppet the world is earthy colored and green and leafy and the person was wearing an earthy green outfit so a bit about transformation about life and death and mysteries <laughs> awesome shay and this is the last piece we have from shay this is a this is an example of a print that I made. This is a, um, a you know, a small a eight and a half and eleven by eleven piece of paper. Hey, Richard's got a, a copy of it in their little Zoom screen. Um, it says in a black banner across the middle, "Justice requires movement," and it has stars and wind and flowers and footsteps and wheel prints all moving toward the left. <laughs> oh, amazing. Thank you, Shay, for that. Um, Aurora, I'm going to go to yours. Let me see. I just want to make sure that we're switching. Great. I'm just That's looking. Me. Great. Okay. So or this is Aurora's piece um, that is in the masked exhibition right now. Aurora, do you want to do a verbal description or would you like me to? I can do it. Um, so this is a black and white horizontal photograph of me, um, shown from sort of the clavicle down. So you can see my shoulders, um, and I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor, um, up against a black background and I am wearing nothing but a whole lot of crumpled tool, um, that's sort of wrapping all around my body. Um, and because the photo is in black and white and the tool is all shown in different shades of gray and white, where um, it becomes more opaque wherever it's overlapping on my body or overlapping on itself. And the pieces that are sort of um, one single layer against the black background are showing a lot darker. Um, and this is a photograph that I was referring to earlier. Um, it's one of a few, but it is one that kept bringing up the idea of a wedding dress and uh, kept prompting random visitors to my studio to ask me if I was making art about getting married, um, which I wasn't. I was making art about my connective tissue disorder and how my connective tissue feels like that tool looks, which is very crumply and tangled up. And, and then- um, The title of that, it, it's right. It's, um, it's, it's fibrosis covered in tool, yes. right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sure is. <laughs> and fibrosis is scar tissue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just a quick, uh, this is on our website, which is in the comments of this. For both Liam's work and Aurora's work, they are both part of an audio tour of this exhibit as well. So there are verbal descriptions and their artist bios are also on our website. So you can find those as well. And then I also want to call up Aurora's um, Sorry, I'm just navigating. Let's see. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I'm trying to like do this while I'm yep, going to stop sharing for a moment. Over. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and then start again just because. Let me see. We've got, so I've got a lot of tabs. Great. So perfect. Um, let me share Aurora's. This is Aurora's Instagram. And yeah. So. I'm going to just scroll and find. So as you can see, basically, I'm just going to do a quick, I'm scrolling through an inst, a desktop Instagram, which is a grid of three pictures across, and then it goes down. Um, in the top, we're seeing some of Aurora's new watercolor pictures and photographs. Um, or how about this one? I love this <laughs> one. Yeah. 
So that, so this is a photograph. It's a black and white photograph of my body. Um, it's my back and all of my hair. I have like sort of long curly-ish hair and it's sort of all pulled over one shoulder. You can visibly see that one of my shoulders is lower than the other um, and that they're kind of curved. Um, and I am once again naked and I'm sort of sitting with my knees in front of me, like as if I'm holding my knees in fetal position, which I probably am in that photo. Um, and superimposed across my lower back um, is a white line of an EKG heartbeat um, taken from an EKG from when I was nine years old. I think that one's from when I was nine years old. We'll say it was. Um, and actually the reason that this reappeared on my Instagram so recently, because I made this piece when I was in grad school, was I was looking at some of my old work and this piece really called me. And I remember when I made it, one of my professors told me that the white line was too bold. Like it was too overpowering the image. Um, and I should like do something with it. Or I should like take it off of the black or I should make it a black line. So it's really subtle. And that it was like, I was throwing the, the heartbeat in people's face. Like I was making people look at it. And at the time, because I was in grad school and a professor told me I needed to change something. I like really struggled with that. I, I did a bunch of different versions of it. And I just didn't really like any of them. And so I eventually just sort of trashed the piece. And I was looking through all my images and I was like, she was wrong. <laughs> this is the right way for this piece to work. So I'm glad it um, got reconciled. But I really love that piece too. I'm glad you like it. I love that piece. <laughs> Let me find one more. And Aurora, if there's anything that you are really feeling, um, but I'm just looking- Do you want to do a cyanotype? Yeah, how about let's do this one. Cool. So um, my big thing of the recent years has been cyanotyping. Um, I do it with digital negatives. So they tend to be anywhere from like five by six up to 22 by 30 inches. Um, I make those ones in a kiddie pool. And they are incredible to make to me because um, well, it's just sorry. cyanotypes are uh, a UV process, so you need to use the sun to print them. And this one in this image is it's called Titania, and it's a blue print of, sorry, a motorcycle is going by uh, very loudly. It's a blue print of a photograph of me lying on the ground outside with some like leaves, dead leaves under my hair. It's a photo I took in the fall. I am once again naked. Um, and I have my eyes closed and I have my, one of my hands sort of cradling my head. And the print is on a piece of white paper that you can tell because the edges are clearly, um, they're really irregular. They were painted on, um, I painted it on in the dark and I clearly did a terrible job of covering my piece in cyanotype <laughs> because there's this huge white patch at the top that kind of curves in where my neck is. Um, and so it's actually one of my favorite cyanotypes I've ever made. And the reason I love cyanotypes so much is that it allows me to embrace the amount of chance that I really feel was missing from my digital work because I only do digital photography for both like access reasons mostly. Um, but I missed that moment of chance and of, uh, unpredictability that I really feel is important to my process because of disability. I feel like there's a lot that I can't predict and that I have to just leave up to chance. Um, and also that chance can just change everything in a moment. Um, and so the cyanotype process has been really transformative to my practice because of that. Um, it really, it allows me to embrace things as, as they change and sort of allow nature to have it say on what my art looks like, which is a big part of my practice. If you look at my other work. <laughs> okay. And wonderful. Um, I also want to finish up with, let's see, sorry, I'm doing, okay. Let me get Liam's work. My, um, I also had this really fun thing happen where my screen, <laughs> Uh, my computer shut down as we were starting to do this. So let me get um, Liam's work and. Pat, there's a note in the chat that says yes. that interpreters are not 
Um, yes, I'm going to try to spotlight them. I'm going to stop share again. Let me, this is just, you know, such a fun time. I'm going to spotlight, process. spotlight Lindsay, you're spotlighted. And then I'm going to share my screen. Let me get Liam's work. And we are approaching 530, but we'll probably go a few minutes over just as a heads up to folks. Um, great. So I am going to start with, um, this is the, Liam submitted several pieces and one of the pieces is in. And so let me just get this and we are going to share now. Share. Here we go. Okay. Let me double check how that's happening on the screen. I just want to make sure we get, okay, great. And yeah. we've got, there we go. Perfect. Um, and thanks for that heads up. So Liam, I'm also going to spotlight you. And so we should get both of you now. So Liam, would you like me to do a verbal description of this or would you like to do this? If you could do it, that would be great. Sure, perfect. So this is a collage, a multimedia collage. Um, uh, in the background are kind of patterned pieces. There's wallpaper, a floral wallpaper. In the very back, it looks like there's flowers and maybe rocks in the back, crystals. Um, and then overlaid over that are some square images. One is that image of like a living room with a kind of sage gray, green teal door and the floral wallpaper. There's a bright red chair at center um, and a lamp on a table. Um, and then there is also a picture of um, foliage um, and a street. There's some debris on the street and there is um, coming out from the edge, there is like a, like a parked trailer potentially. Over that is a figure sitting backwards in a chair um, layered on top of that. It says chapter 28, pandemics, um, reducing the distance between me and my story, unprecedented improvement. Thank you for your patience. The figure, their eyes are covered with red and with text. Um, and then they're wearing a white shirt. They have white pale skin. One of their hands is at the bottom of their face. Um, and then going through towards the figure is um, a helicopter. You want to tell us a little bit about this? Uh, yeah, there's another message in the chat. Oh, yeah. I'm going to remove you from the spotlight. We'll hear you, Liam, but we'll put but then um, we should get Lindsay back as the spotlight. Okay, um, so this is a mixture of pieces. Um, the collage in the back is from high school um, and it's actually the collage and then the um, box drawing outline um, that was like a piece that I made in high school. Um, and then the photograph um, was from that photo shoot that I had with myself um, where I was trying to embrace my gender euphoria, I suppose. Um, and then I found in a magazine, um, I really like to do like found word kind of like poetry stuff. Um, and I thought, um, yeah this was appropriate. So this was like the, the, the first piece of a series of pieces um, that I called chapter 28, which is also the age that I am. <laughs> Great. Okay. Liam, I'm going to go through, we're going to do three. So um, let me know. We've got the second one, the third one, I want to show the one that's in masked, but is there one of the middle ones that you'd like to show? Um, this one's good. Uh, that, one's uh, good. that one? Sure. Right. Um, <laughs> so I also, um, during the pandemic, I made like a calendar that was, um, it was collages with these um, different poems. So the like, okay, this is a, there's two pictures here. The one on the right or the one on the left is um, a black and white painting of me in a bathtub. I'm facing, um, I'm 
facing backwards. Um, <clears throat> and there's a sink next to me. It's like an old claw footed bathtub. Um, and yeah, it's like monochromatic painted. Um, and then laid over that is a image of a stack of cookies, their chocolate chip cookies. Um, and then <clears throat> the, there's text over it that says, they were truly generous during a difficult time, reciprocate their kindness. Um, and this was a piece about uh, embracing my body um, and all of my body in a way that um, I hadn't ever. Um, so yeah, it started as a, a photograph of me naked in a bathtub with all of my curves and I turned that into a painting and then have that piece. On the right is a, it's, again, it started off as a collage in the back, or it's, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, in the back, I suppose, is another picture of me uh, sitting in a um, folding chair. Uh, the chair's backwards. I'm wearing a white V-neck and earrings and my arm is over the chair, kind of, I don't know how you describe that. Um, your hands, like, to be like your, one hand over another with your hand in the foreground, yep. Sure, yeah. And yeah. then um, sort of laid over that is another um, collage and it, it's a bunch of images, a bunch of tiny images. Um, I, I don't know, that was just, a graphic that I found in a magazine. Um, but the words say, for a moment, your eyes open all the way, explore the pleasure in taking it easy. Um, and yeah, so again, during the pandemic, I, I stepped into my gender identity and um, stillness. And so that's what that is about. Beautiful. And I know we're over time. I just want to do a quick share. This is Liam's piece that is in um, the exhibition right now that we have masked. And this is another mixed media collage. Um, at the foreground on the left side is a red curtain being pulled aside, um, like, a, like a curtain of a, a stage curtain. And a white hand is pulling it aside and it is showing a picture of, I believe this is Liam, but a figure walking away from the gaze. Um, they're next to water and there are buildings around. And Liam, I, I remember you said this is a very distinctive building. Is it the Botanical Gardens? Was that what it was? <laughs> no, it's what the is Church it? of I Scientology. Forget. Oh, it's sci I knew it was something. Uh, Scientology, very different. Okay, great. Um, Not and, any association, just that was the, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> geographic location. <laughs> And this is overlaid um, faintly in the background. There's a bouquet of flowers, roses, mostly yellow um, and pink roses with a white flower going off to the right and at the top. Um, and the person is in a t-shirt and pants with rolled uh, hems and carrying a bag. And over top of it, it said, but this doesn't tell the full story because they've bloomed to survive the best we could. Um, and so this is the piece that is traveling with masked right now. And Liam, I'm just going to bring us all back. If there's anything you want to share about that piece, and I'm going to remove the spotlight. And then, folks, I know we are um, we are wrapping up, and we are over time. But Liam, feel free to share that. And then for my other artists, if there's like any last thing you want to leave us with, including how we can find your work, that would be amazing. Um, I think that piece, just like the other ones, you know, it's it's a a mixture of a digital um, print. Actually, that one didn't have a digital print. It was a collage with a painting that was made from a photograph, um, and then another collage laid over that. So um, yeah, really uh, the whole like set of pieces is just, uh, you know, all the different layers of my identities um, coming into one. And yeah. That's Thank that. you so much for sharing that. So folks, we, of course, we knew this, we are over time and we, we, but you all did 
such a beautiful job of already like responding to each other. And so I just want to give everyone an opportunity to just share how people can find you, how they can find your art. Um, and so if we'll just go around, um, Shay, can you just share how people can find you, how they can find your art, any last thoughts? And then we'll go Shay, Aurora, Liam, and then we'll check in with Richard and Heidi, and then we'll be done. Hi, Shay speaking. Um, my business card says uh, cheap magic, full service for sale or for hire by chance or appointment. I feel like that's fitting. Uh, <laughs> you can find me at Shay Witso on Instagram, but it's not all art. It's just life and art is part of life. Um, also the performance company that I sometimes do work with is called the Royal Frog Ballet. You can Google it. It's the only one. Um, there's a website. It's pretty cute. Um, and, you know, uh, reach out at shaywitso at gmail.com if you want to talk more about anything in particular. I don't have a snazzy art website up. Uh, that's how you can find my artwork and me as a person to connect with. Great. And that's going to be in the comment section of this video as well. Oh, yeah. Sounds great. Great. Aurora. You're muted, Aurora. Shoot. This is the problem with muting myself. Okay. Uh, you can reach me on Instagram at Aurora Burger. You can uh, find me on Twitter at Aurora Burger, but I have not used that account in a long time. So if you find me there, only going to be rants about disability. Um, I also have a website, auroraburger.com. Uh, you can find more of my pictures, varying amounts of clothing, uh, and also some of my other work, as well as some of my writing stuff. I am also currently uh, in MAST, which is touring Vermont with Inclusive Arts Vermont. Um, I have a show coming up online somewhere in the internet with Art Beyond Sight out of New York City. Um, and you could pick up a copy, very expensive copy, I apologize, of um, Redefining Disability, which was recently published by Brill and has a chapter in it that I wrote called Disability Aesthetics, a Crypt Artistry Manifesto. Find me on the internet and I can give you a free copy. I didn't say that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> And Liam, how can we find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at theycreate.vt. Um, I have a website, which I don't know how long, much longer I'm going to have the domain for because that is like, so expensive. Um, but it's uh, theycreatevt.com. And uh, I, I think I took my store down, but you can see um, some of my other art, including um, different kinds of portraits that I am happy to do as commission. I do graphic or er, digital portraits, um, graphite portraits, painting portrait, painted portraits um, of people. I'm not very good at doing animals, so. I guess I could do like a landscape too, if, if you like wanted that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay. And um, excellent, excellent. Um, any final thoughts? And this could be from Heidi, Richard, or any of our artists, or excuse me, I, I always do that. I use R as a possessive. Any of these brilliant artists, I do not own you. I am just grateful to share community with you. <laughs> I would like to name that our excellent co-facilitators are also all artists. And I feel like, I know it was a time crunch, but I would love at some point to hear more of your, each of your brilliant voices about what you make. I feel like it's so great to have you as co-facilitators in this space. And also like, I want to hear all the juicy stuff about y'all and your work. <laughs> so just for the, a shout out for other folks watching that, uh, you know, maybe somebody could host a little cat Heidi Richard chat. I would facilitate it. I'm just saying, I don't know. But um, I just want to honor that there's so much that you each bring that wasn't as present in this conversation that I just want to bring into the space, even just in name. 
Thank you, Shay. Much appreciated. Yeah. I feel really grateful. Richard, I get to share my work life with Heidi and I get to share my performer life with Richard. And so I know these two individuals. Um, Heidi and I use the term artner to describe our working relationship. Um, and I feel very much similarly with Richard about that when we're in creative spaces together. And so sh thank you for acknowledging that. And it's just, it is really beautiful to share creative community with this cohort of people. And um, I have major gratitude for today and for just the openness and sharing and generosity of spirit that everybody brought. And so, yeah. Um, Richard, Heidi, Liam, Aurora, any final thoughts as we're wrapping up? Um, I, just would like, I would like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I know everybody has some type of uh, Zoom fatigue at this point in time. It's a lot to get online and get on video and express about yourself. So once again, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, this is Heidi. I just, I echo the thanks and appreciation and um, feel privileged to be able to listen and, you know, participate in the way that I did um, and look forward to more conversations when they are um, able to happen. Yeah. Um. Wonderful. Uh, so this will be on our Facebook page. We'll also put it on YouTube as well. So feel free to share it around with friends. Um, we had some, you know, uh, just some gratitude shared in the comments for seeing everybody's work and experiencing that. I want to thank our interpreters as well. Michael and Lindsay have been amazing, amazing um, uh, companions on a lot of our digital programming. And they, you know, they're here to to do work, but also it really feels like they're a beautiful part of this community. So um, thanks to them for their effort, their energy, and their time. And thank you to everyone. Um, be in touch. We're around. We would love to connect with you more. And uh, happy Pride, everyone. Go create. Go go. Kind of. I don't know. I'm just. Uh, I'm just really moved by this conversation. So thank you all. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for, Thanks for being here with us.